I take as one of the starting points um, for the book uh, a newspaper column that Putin wrote in 1999, a few days before he became acting president, uh, in which uh, he writes uh, that for the first time in the past 200 to 300 years, Russia faces the real danger that it could be relegated to the second or even the third tier of global powers. So 2014 was obviously a watershed moment in relations between Russia and the West. It was meant to be the year that Russia hosted the Winter Olympics and was welcomed back into this so-called first tier of nations. Instead, it became the year that Russia asserted itself in a very different way. Uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, were, were perhaps the only two nations um, to emerge from the Soviet collapse uh, that didn't, hadn't come up with um, a coherent historical narrative that unified the whole country. The events of 2014 were about many things, but I think they were at least in part um, a clash between these competing Russian and Ukrainian attempts uh, to transcend this conundrum of 1991 and mint new national identities. So instead of focusing on 1991, uh, Putin turns to the one event that had the narrative potential to unite the nation, which was victory in the Second World War, or as it's still known in modern Russia, the Great Patriotic War. One of the key arguments that I make is that this becomes a kind of national building block, because views on 1917 and views on 1991 are very disparate, but pride in the defeat of Nazism transcends political allegiance, generation or economic status. Part of the reason for this is obviously that um, much of the Russian war narrative really is very inspiring. And it also was, of course, a victory. But of course there were other parts of the war narrative as well. Um, there was the deportations of around two million Soviet citizens, including the Crimean Tatars and the Chechens. Uh, the the post-war deportations of Balts and Western Ukrainians. So just after Victory Day in 2005, um, 60,000 members of a Kremlin-sponsored youth group marched through central Moscow in matching t-shirts, and when they reached the end of the route, they were handed bullet casings by war veterans. In 2005, um, a state news agency for the first time distributed these orange and black ribbons, the St. George's Ribbon, as a symbol of victory. And on March the 18th, 2014, when Putin appears on Red Square at a rally to celebrate uh, just having signed the annexation documents for Crimea in the Kremlin uh, with Sergei Aksyonov, the Kremlin-appointed leader of Crimea. Um, when you look at what Aksyonov is wearing, he's in a big black overcoat and he has tied to the top of it uh, not a Russian flag, um, but the orange and black St. George's ribbon. And obviously, uh, most countries have selective memories when it comes to their wartime experience. But in Russia, kind of questioning the war narrative becomes almost akin to Holocaust denial in the West. But certainly the presence on Maidan of flags and symbols of the wartime Ukrainian resistance movement, which had obviously spent much of the war allied with the Nazis, allowed the Kremlin to kind of repaint this choice with the colors of the Second World War. When I was there covering it, the day that I first realized there would be a war was on Victory Day, um, when I was in Donetsk and the city was really felt like it was on the brink Everyone was wearing orange and black, screaming about fascists. And the story of that conflict in East Ukraine, um, I tell in the book largely through um, the story of Alexander Khodorkovsky, who was uh, the number two guy in the so-called Donetsk People's Republic. And Khodorkovsky was a local who had grown up in the Donbass in the 1970s. And he told me that you know when he was growing up in the Donbass, all of the books he read as a child were about the war. All of the films he saw were war films. You know, it seems, I would say, that Putin has, in many ways, succeeded in his attempts to turn Russia into what he called a first-tier nation. But I was standing there in Irkutsk and thinking, this is now 17 years into Putin's rule over Russia, and here people were drinking themselves to death on poisoned bath fluid because they couldn't afford vodka while being bombarded with never-ending tales about the glory of a victory that occurred 72 years previously. So I think, you know, Putin has succeeded in this mission to create a sense of nation and to rally Russians around a patriotic idea. But instead of transcending the trauma of the Soviet collapse, uh, in many ways he's exploited it 
and the narrative has focused a lot more on the past than it has on the future. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.